If you ever want to get on my uh, podcast, the best way to do it is to call me a nerd on a message board. We're going to talk with Reese Gordon coming up next on Locked Out Orange Fox. You are Locked On Horn Frogs. Your daily podcast on the TCU Horn Frogs. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. So we're doing a special edition of Locked On Horn Frogs today. We have a guest. Reese Gordon is with us. If you're active on the Horn Frog Blitz website, which is part of the 247 Network, Jeremy Clark, I've mentioned before, does a fantastic job covering the team. I would encourage you to subscribe to that service if you have not. Um, but you might know this guy as Howdy555. Is that right, Reese? Is that your username? It's a really stupid name, but <laughs> it is what it is. I don't know. It, there was no real thought put into that, like mm -hmm. half the things that I do in life. So sure. There you go. Well, I mean, like, I feel like there's not, when did you, when did you join? Do you remember? Have you been a long time well, subscriber? I, I was, I was on back in the day with Jeremy when he like, was working with rivals. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you're I a long time. Remember, user. I don't know what my name was back then. So. Yeah, it's kind of, I feel like message board usernames are kind of like uh, your first email address. Like, I think my first email address was like football freako4 or something, something like that go. at AOL.com. You just sort of pick something that you feel like will stick. And then it, it happens to be what you, what you use for the foreseeable future. But Reese is going to talk some TCU football and baseball with us today. First off, man, what is your, like, what's your TCU story? How did you kind of latch onto the frogs and what has been your, journey to fandom in Fort Worth? Um, well, back in high school here in East Texas, I went to Pine Tree High School, graduated in 2004. A lot of my friends were going to A&M or Texas mm -hmm. or Baylor. And honestly, my sister graduated from Baylor and I've been there and I, it, I didn't feel the vibe for me. So yeah. my yeah. mom though did go to TCU and she said she wanted uh, me to go check it out and so um so i did and and i was just like i'm gonna go here it <laughs> so yeah, yeah. ever since 04 though football and 04 wasn't very good but 05 06 07 08 09 10 11 14 15 so we've had a lot of good seasons so my fandom has grown every every year and i feel like 23 I'm going to live and die just as hard, if not harder. So, um, yeah, I mean, the, the run last year was absolutely incredible. And I guess kind of both of us are in the same boat. Like I, I really started following the team in 2009 when it was kind of becoming apparent to me, I might end up going to school there and then ended up as a student there in 2012. But like we, we've seen really the glory days for the most part, Reese. I mean, we, we've had some like tough seasons here and there, but we've watched, the ascension and kind of them climb the mountaintop. So like, what were some of your feelings last season during that ride? Because I'm a, I'm a somewhat optimistic person. I feel like I'm pretty realistic about like expectations and what the team can do. If I'm being honest, I didn't know if, if what happened last season was possible. I didn't know if it was possible at TCU, especially like in the new era of NIL and you know, how much blue blood teams were going to, how much money they were going to throw at student athletes if it was possible for them to get as far as they did and then make it to the national championship game. I mean, I know for you that had to be incredible to watch it happen. Well, I think I started off in the beginning of the season, just wanting to see them get back into the top 25. Yeah. yeah. Because it had been, I'm, I'm not even sure when, you know, it's been a minute because we yeah, been a few years. Yeah. Yeah. So at least for more than a week, so right. when we beat OU the way we did, I knew I knew that, that we were going to have a good team because I saw a different animal there. Mm -hmm. But I also was terrified the entire season once things got to 7-0, and 8-0, and, and then 9-0, and, and, you know, and I was like, man, 
was like, this is so stressful. It, and it was. Yeah. And then losing to Kansas State in the Big 12 championship game was heartbreaking. But when they found out that they were going to the playoffs, which on the board, I said, I don't think that TCU gets in without going undefeated. Sure. But yeah. we were, But we were also fortunate that Tennessee lost. Mm-hmm. Alabama had two losses. Yeah, so, USC lost in that Pac-12 right, title game. Right, in the in the in the Pac-12. Right. So when we knew that we were going to the the Fiesta Bowl against Michigan, I knew we were going to beat Michigan. Mm. I mean, I just had this feeling from the time that I stepped off the plane in in uh, Arizona, and then when they did, and when I when it hits you like it did. Some people were there around me. They know when 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 we when this clock when the clock ticked final second off and the realization that we were playing in the national championship game was unlike I, I, I can't I can't compare that. I don't have kids, but if I did, yeah. maybe like to the birth of a child. Right? Yeah. I mean, so I don't even view the the, the national championship game as being I was there for the last time when it when, when it was when it was really really good. The national championship was what it was. Yeah. I didn't go. I flushed. Yeah, we can just we can just black that out. It didn't happen. <laughs> no worries. I flushed that. I flushed that because I didn't go. Right. So other people had a harder time doing that because of all the other circumstances that surrounded that game with the weather and whatever mm-hmm. and the money. So I have nothing but. I look at. I look at 2022 as a smashing success. For sure. And now turning our attention to 2023, year two of the Sunny Dykes era, um, our friends at FanDuel, their sponsor here at Locked On, they have the over-under win total for the Frogs at seven and a half. And I I might have to do an episode about this later this week. I don't know. And it just kind of sort of plays into what we've been talking about to a certain extent. But I'm not sure if there is a national runner-up that is getting less – like I can't remember a national runner-up that would get less respect than TCU. I think last year the over-under win total was six, and that was like year one of a new coaching staff. Um, but there is there is a lot of turnover. Obviously, you're placing a ton of players. I get that. But, Reese, I mean, to me, I want to get your thoughts. Over-under seven-and-a-half wins for TCU in 2023. Well, I first of all, I want to say I think TCU is probably one of the hardest teams in the country to set – the over-unders on mm-hmm. because they – you could even see it in our point spreads for the last couple years. Some of them were just – I mean, even last year they were they were kind of – they were kind of wonky, uh, yeah. for lack of a better word. But I got to say that I want to say it's disrespect, but I also can see where these uh, – odds makers are coming from just because we have so many guys that left for the NFL, Mm -hmm. but those guys were there last year and they picked us to have six wins. So, yeah. So I think we're going to win 12 games. Okay. (laughs) I love it. I love it. Yeah. I mean, I guess I'll put it, I'll put it this way. Like if they end up seven and five, then I think we're walking, you know, you never know how season's going to play out. You, you can't see the bigger picture right now. But if they ended up seven and five, I just feel like we would walk away being like, man, that's a huge disappointment. I mean, you're probably playing in like the Texas Bowl. Um, there would be some some crazy losses. And the first seven games, I mean, it, it's hard to run the table in any situation, but Colorado, Nickel State, Houston, SMU, West Virginia, Iowa State on the road, that's always tough. They're coming off a rough season. Um, and then after that, they played BYU at home, and then you kind of get into the gauntlet like K State, Tech, Texas, Oklahoma. But I mean, Reese, those first seven games, like if if they're not favored in all those, I think they're probably favored in six of the seven. And so if you get to six and one or seven and zero, oh, then you're you're basically there. But I know, as you said, there's a lot of turnover here. Um, one other thing about this that I find interesting. Are you seeing all the Texas Tech hype? I'm going to have to dig more into Tech, Reese, because I, I saw Brett McMurphy had them as like a, a New Year's Six. I think he was drunk when he posted that. 
Maybe so. Or on some sort of substance. Yeah. Um, and, and and it's almost to the point now where there's so many people that I, I see that are like text a dark horse that it's not they're not even a dark horse anymore. It's like, OK, all, everybody's picking them. So they're kind of like they're almost up there to that, you know, sort of contender level. I know Todd Brooks is coming back and they I don't really believe in Tyler Shuck. Um, yeah. But I, I guess which which team do you think in the Big 12? Is it Texas? Is it Texas Tech? Kansas State? The defending champs. Who are you most worried about as far as the the team that could be just like head and shoulders better than everybody else in the league? If there is one in your mind, none of them. None of them. Okay. Oh, yeah. but as far as dark horse in the in the Big Twelve, it's it's TCU because mm-hmm. of how they're picking us, and and we won. We didn't win the Big Twelve last year, so to speak. I, I really. That's a whole other story getting into the, the Big 12 championship game when you already play right. the team, whatever. So um, as far as those other teams, I don't I don't really think – Texas Tech has one 10-win season in its entire history, or at least in the last 50 years. Yeah. Um, for, for them to – I do like um, – I think uh, – gosh, the name – his name, <laughs> Coach McGuire – yeah, Joe he, McGuire. Yeah, he he to me seems like a a coach that's going to have them keep going in the right direction. Mm-hmm. But I also think that he cannot coach the way he did last year, where he would just go for it on his own like thirty yard line. Yeah, like over and over. I mean, mm-hmm. that's why TCU was able to win that game and get some separation in that game. Sure. Well, I don't know. I, I think it. I don't think you can ever buy Texas Tech. TCU has yeah. the skins on the wall. We've proven it. Even if nobody, if everybody wants to get amnesia from one year to the next and forget, but we have that. Texas Tech has no skins on the wall except for that one season in 2008 when Crabtree made that amazing catch against Texas right. and ruined Texas's uh, national. Ch- well, did it ruin it? I don't. Yeah, they. I mean, they didn't end up getting in. That was the year that there was a three-way tie between them and Tech and Oklahoma, and I feel like Oklahoma got the nod. I'd have to do a quick Google right. search, but yeah, I think so, you're right. So that's so that was 15 years ago, maybe. Mm-hmm. But I don't. I don't buy Shuck. I don't. Yeah. I, I. I think he uh, he looked pretty good against uh, Ole Miss, but I don't buy Ole Miss either. So I don't <laughs> right. really know. I don't really know where to fall on that. That's, but you know, I may be completely wrong. I mean, we could all be, you know, finally, you know, look stupid on this, but mm-hmm. I, I think Brett McMurphy ha- having Texas Tech playing uh, Alabama in the Sugar Bowl. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, I think it was a Sugar is a Bowl. New Year's Six Bowl. So he's basically saying they're going to, uh, they're going to basically go undefeated. To get into the playoffs, they basically have to go undefeated. Mm-hmm. Or at least, you know, be like a if there was another Big 12 team that got in, maybe their second place like K-State was last year. But, yeah, it's it's a crazy – I mean, I don't buy it either. I like Joe McGuire. I think he's a good coach. I also think Joey is a guy that the media loves because he's high energy and he gives a lot of access to his program. And so he's kind of an, an easy, like, dude to root for, which is fine. I mean, there's – you know, there's something to be said about that. And, and Zach Kitley is their offensive coordinator. He's in year two. He was at – Houston Baptist and then Western Kentucky, really bright offensive mind. But I think you're right. I feel like both those guys at times coach them out of games as well with their aggressive style. And, yes, when TCU finally took the lead against Tech, that could have been a much closer football game, I mean, at least the final score. Um, But Tech kept giving the ball to TCU in Tech territory, in scoring territory, because they couldn't convert those fourth downs. Um, we'll get back to Reese here in a second. I do want to quickly mention one of our new sponsors. So Bird Dogs is a new sponsor of the Locked On Network. Bird Dogs, if you want comfortable pants or shorts, they're the place to go. I got uh, a couple of shorts in the mail from Bird Dogs recently, and I love them. They fit great. They're comfortable. And you can wear them really in a lot of different situations. I wore them to work today. Um, you can wear them just out and about at, by the pool, wherever you want to. Birddogs.com slash locked on college. You get a free tumbler with every purchase. If you go to birddogs.com slash locked on college, great comfort, great fit. I can finally be the frat star that I never was at TCU because my bird dogs, they, you know, the new style there. Um, and they got some great products, and we're happy that they're sponsoring us here at the Locked On Network. 
Okay, Reese, so kind of transitioning a little bit. We'll stick with football, though. Um, this team, this TCU football team, as you go into the season, what in your mind, you know, position group, coaching staff related, whatever it might be, what's your biggest concern going into year two here with Sonny Dykes? What's your biggest concern for this football team uh, as they roll into the fall? Well, as much as high as I am on the Frogs, I still – it's, I think it comes down to how fast does the offense adjust to uh, Kendall Bryles' system. Mm -hmm. I think Chandler Morris is a perfect quarterback for his for his system. I really do. And plus, he's um, Morris. Morris is an accurate quarterback. He's his arm isn't like legendary or anything by that stretch of, by any stretch of yeah. the imagination. But I think, um, I think. I think that's my concern on offense, maybe offensive line. Receivers I feel real strongly about. I think that the running back group minus Kendry Miller is still going to be good. On defense, I'm worried about the defensive line like other people have talked about. Yeah. Uh, you know, linebacker, we have a lot of experience. But like last year, you can't really make up for guys just going down. Somehow TCU was able mm -hmm. to – to put that thing together with, you know, bubble gum and duct tape, even though they lost like three of their second unit linebackers. Right. Or, or, or the depth. So my concern offensively is, is just how fast they come out, start. And then defensively it would be, it would be the defensive line because you got Dominic Williams, but everybody else is kind of, uh, I mean, Question what mark. Yeah. What are we gonna get? What are we gonna get from from them on the edge? Yeah. Yeah, the edge especially, and it's it's kind of fascinating because you know you look at like what Dylan Horton did, and he ended up being really productive. So much of that was kind of towards the tail end of the year, and he really flashed in that Michigan game. So it, it wasn't like they had a dominant pass rush all season long, but at the same time. It's not only like the starters, as you talked about, it's the depth too. And, and you know, like, do you have enough bodies to kind of rotate in and out and not have a significant drop off? Um, so we'll, we'll see what they do kind of as they wrap up this portal window. But, but I think that is a concern. So, so flipping the script a little bit, what do you think the biggest strength is for this team? Reese, I know you talked about the receiver group. You really like that. Linebackers, there's talent there. Biggest strength for this TCU team going into uh, this football season. I actually was thinking about this earlier because I do my research and my homework. That's, That's right. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I was thinking about this and I, I really don't think it's one unit. I think, like I said, if this thing comes together, the receivers have playmakers. The running backs group has playmakers. The quarterback is a playmaker. The tight ends with Jared Wiley and DJ Rogers. You know, Rogers is somebody that I, I really kind of think could be an X factor on at, at tight end. I think that's the strength is that it there's talent on the offense completely. Mm -hmm. Receivers, I could say that 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 is the the absolute strength, but I don't I don't know. All I watched was the spring game. I I can't just say for sure. Right. I don't think they're going to miss Jordan Hudson that much as far as, you know, people are kind of like angry about that. And I mean, him mm -hmm. going to SMU, whatever, but, but I think they have guys there, Jojo and, and JPR and um, Cordell Russell as a freshman, I think is going to make an impact. Uh, Savion Williams, everybody's, mm -hmm. everybody's waiting for him to really put his stamp. He, he kind of did last year at times in the red zone. I'd like to see him be a very consistent player throughout the season. Right. Yeah. Savion is, uh, he was solid for them last year. I think it'll be um, intriguing to see what he does if he's the guy on the outside, which I think he will be, you know, how he stands up against kind of number one corners. One thing about Savion, everybody kind of like assumed that Quentin was the dude that would go up and get the 50 50 ball because of his size and his frame. But it was really like, like Savion was in some ways better at that. Like he, he could really, you know, the Oklahoma game, he had that great catch. He did it at the end of the game against West Virginia uh, where it was just like, all right, one-on-one -on -one, 
I'm just bigger than this dude, and I'm going to go up and get the football. Um, and, yes, I think the inside receivers, you know, yeah, spring camp, you have to be careful with that. But John Paul Richardson and JoJo Earl are not Gunnar Henderson. Like, these aren't out-of-nowhere guys who you weren't expecting to be factors on the team. This is like J- – JPR obviously was – Really productive at Oklahoma State. JoJo Earl was, you know, committed to Alabama, signed at Alabama, was a somewhat of a factor there in the receiver room. So I think you're you're on to something there. And, um, yeah, it'll be fun to see this team in action again as we kind of roll into, uh, in some ways, you know, the same coaching staff, but as you said, a new era of offense with with Kendall Bryles. Um, we'll take one more break, and then we'll, we'll talk about something fun. We're going to discuss the baseball team. They're on a little bit of a roll here. And uh, I want to get Reese's thoughts on um, the future of TCU baseball in a moment. So we'll do that next. Okay, so we're talking with Reese Gordon. You might know him as Howdy555 on the message boards. And um, if if you've seen his post, you know that he can get frustrated, as we all do. You know, we're emotional watching this these teams. TCU baseball has been an up-and-down season. Now, They've won. Uh, I mean, they've won six in a row. They beat Texas State tonight, eight to two, in a midweek game. They have a game Thursday, Friday, Saturday against K State, and then the Big Twelve tournament. But Reese, I, I want to know because I know you have, you know, expressed your frustration at times about this team, about Kirk Sarloos and this coaching staff. Uh, do you feel any better about the future of the program or about this group in the middle of this? kind of six-game winning streak. What what are you feeling about TC baseball these days? Well, I think – I posted this earlier today, but coming into the game tonight, TCU's team ERA is 5.0. Yeah. Now, that's sad. Even sadder is that that's the third best team ERA in the Big 12. How I didn't realize that, that. That's interesting. How is, yeah. that, how is that even possible? Because – and that's why I don't believe in them – they, they, they kind of have figured out something with their weekend rotation, but mm. they have so many freshman arms that they are relying on with Klecker, who has had a very good season, all things considered. I want to be fair. You know, he's a true freshman, probably right. 19 years old, and he's got a 4.19 ERA with eight wins this year. That's mm. very good. But they, they have not hit on Vander High who was coming in from Kansas. He's not a young player. No. Um, so I just – I'm frustrated because under under Schlossnagel – I said that name terribly. No, under, I think you, you, you got it. You got it there, yeah, Schlossnagel. Well, it, it's just a weird it name, is, yeah. right? <laughs> so, so is Sarlus. I mean, that's – Yeah. That's a you – know, whatever. So – Coming in when we, or back in the heyday, we talked about the heyday of football, mm-hmm. right? Being in it, kind of. Well, TCU's hey, baseball's heyday was kind of ended in like 2017. I mean, we went we went to five uh, College World Series in a span of 2010 to 2000. Yeah, it was four in a row five and like and five years. five right. and nine years or something like that. Right, right. And and the thing that always was a constant was a good pitching staff with a solid or awesome uh, three-man weekend rotation. Mm-hmm. What, where is that? I mean, th- that's why I think a lot of people are so frustrated with Sarlos is because he's, he was the pitching coach on, on those teams. He's been here a while, and, and, I, and I'm struggling to remember what year he came pitching coach on at least team team and they had a great team era he seemed like the guy you know he seemed like he was really the hot commodity as a coach so mm-hmm. i don't know what has happened because this t- last year their their team era wasn't very good I, and i don't know off the top what they finished with but this year it's right around five so what are we you know, what are we doing? I mean, if we're going to be elite, that that pitching staff has got to be elite. That's just how it is. So if they don't make the tournament, which they have this three-game set against K-State, and then, I mean, they could go win the Big 12 tournament and get an automatic qualifying bid. Uh, they could also win a few games and have a pretty good at-large case. But if they don't make the tournament, Reese, are you ready to, to move on and kind of overhaul this coaching staff? Or what, what's your thoughts as we sit here today? I mean, everybody is 
there's only two camps that you're in. You're either hell yes <laughs> or you're absolutely not. We can't move on because it's been only two, less than two years. Yeah. But in my mind, I think there's just other coaches out there that could get more out of what the players and what we've seen. Um, I don't, I don't understand what has happened to a lot of these guys with uh, it from, we've talked about pitching, but the, the, we've left so many men on base and situational hitting has been terrible. And yeah. so I, I don't know. I mean, I, I want to say me personally, I am a pro fire coaches person. I, I don't, I'm just not that guy that wants to sit around and wait around for seven years while yeah. the team goes from being terrible to being just okay. I mean, it's about winning. No, I get it. That's that can be your political platform. I am pro <laughs> pro firing coaches, getting stuff done. Uh, I think so. Here's where I think you're right. The pitching development is really concerning because yes, when they were making Omaha runs. They were churning out dudes, Preston Morrison, Brandon Finnegan, Alex Young, Tyler Alexander, uh, you know, Brian Howard, the guys in the bullpen like Trey Teagle, Riley Farrell. And I, I know, like, those dudes are really good. Obviously, they worked really hard. But at the same time, there was a coaching staff that was a huge part of bringing them in, identifying them, and then making them into great pitchers. The last few seasons, uh, a couple of years ago, Johnny Ray started the year as your Friday night starter. And by the end of the season, like he could, like he had melted down so much he could not get an out. And they had to, you know, shuffle things around. They had Russell Smith who stepped up nicely, but it, it never really meshed and totally came together. Last year, you know, Austin Krobe got hurt and uh, Marcelo Perez kind of had to come in and save the day as a Saturday starter. And Cam Brown never truly figured it out. And then this season, again, Ryan Vanderhei and Cam Brown are your Friday Saturday guys. Ryan Vanderhei, uh, we we heard like don't worry about the fact that he had like a six point something ERA at Kansas. It was because Kansas is terrible and he's got you know high velocity fastball, big time stuff, and it it hasn't worked out. Like he's completely out of the rotation. Cam Brown uh, started the year as your Saturday guy, and hopefully he can kind of come back. I know we had a good outing against Cal State Fullerton, but he's another player that just it, it hasn't fully clicked and um and so that's an issue and and I don't know what the answer is I think my my first question to Kirk Sarlus would be like what are you doing like what is Adam Winkler doing as as a volunteer assistant as someone who's in charge of your pitching staff and how much how much you know hands-on attention are you paying to that what can we do differently to get better results um and then yeah the hitting's been inconsistent it, when when you have a runner on third and less than two outs, it feels like you should score most of the time. And honestly, like a lot of times, it feels like this team does better when there's nobody on base because they just they they struggle to bring guys in. Uh, I, I'm not in I'm not in the fire Kirk camp. I think the reason I would keep him around is because I really like this freshman class. I, I like Cole Klecker, Luis Rodriguez, Anthony Silva, Carson Bowen, etc. Um, and I would I would want to see one more year of those guys together with him and, and see what that looks like. But I understand your frustration. And, I mean, if they don't turn it around, Reese, like we are talking about another year where um, maybe they sneak into a regional. But, again, like it, it used to be commonplace that we knew like June we're playing games at Lupton. You know, teams are coming here maybe host a super as well. Good chance that we're a national seed. And that's, that's not the case anymore. And I know there's a lot of discussion on the board about like big 12 championships and how much does that mean? Um, but like, I think you would agree with me. The standard is moving on in the postseason. That's how we judge successful baseball seasons. Conference championships mean something. They're cool. It's cool to hang a trophy in the trophy case, but you want to be playing and Super Regionals, you want to be playing the College World Series, and that hasn't happened in a long time now for TCU baseball. Well, I think something that doesn't get talked about a lot, and I don't know Coach Sarlis. I don't know him. Um, to me, he, he often comes across from when I see him interviewed and, and just in the dugout on TV, whatever. 
he just kind of looks lost, like a loop. Mm-hmm. Like there's just something, there's just something there. I don't know. That this is this is me wading into like, you know, psychology of coaches that I don't know. Yeah. But I'm just saying we Sunday we had him speak finally speak out against the the way the team played against Baylor, even though they won. What where was that? You know, like a month ago, or you know. Six weeks ago, right. I mean, right. the way they played against West Virginia was just that was atrocious, and I don't remember anybody ever really talking after that. Yeah, that was rough, and I mean, I think you know the body language stuff doesn't really register to me, and I feel like so much of that is just you know it whether you're winning or losing. If you're losing, we kind of focus in on more on that. I don't know what Kirk is like behind closed doors. I'm not sure if he's been lighting. I'm, I'm sure at points he's been lightening the guys because he's a coach. Um, and they haven't played up to their standard. But, yeah, I mean, I, I'm in the camp of letting Kirk have another season, try to figure this out, try to build this thing. But I totally get I, – I get where you're coming from, and I understand, like, uh, that it's frustrating to sit here and, and feel like the, the program is not up to what it was, um, you know, five or six years ago when we were kind of in the heyday of, of TCU baseball. As you said, uh, anything else you want to weigh in on, Reese? Before we before we wrap things up here. Well, I was going to say you you touched it or you touched on it in the beginning uh, about what Jeremy does with Horn Frog Blitz, and I, I was going to say that that's just uh, it's been awesome. It's been a great community, mm-hmm. and helped me come on with you and uh, a lot of people ragging me about it, which is <laughs> which is great. Um, yeah. But, you know, shout out to all those guys, because I think no matter what um, platform it's on, TCU fans need more and more like what you're doing is great. What they're doing over there, there needs to be as many avenues for TCU fans to be able to um, to weigh in on things, because we're just a smaller school, smaller, we only have a. 100,000 living alumni, finally, apparently. That's what All they right. came up with yesterday or the day before. But So I think that's really great. So kudos to all of those guys and to uh, to to all these platforms. Yeah, more coverage, the better. And uh, Jeremy's the, the gold standard. He does a fantastic job. And so um, a lot of good insider information there. And as you said, like people that are weighing in on topics on, on a daily basis. So – a ton of content. It, Reese, are you on Twitter or anything? Is there any social media that we need to follow you on if, if our listeners are? Do. The only social media I do really it's, is it's more Frog Blitz. Okay. I just – I don't really consider that social media, but that's more like – but, I, you know, I'm not saying anything bad about people that do. Some of those – some people need to do it for their jobs mm-hmm. and whatnot, but I I just kind of weighed out of it other than reading it, you know, re- reading Twitter from time to time. Yeah, no. That's about it. No, it, it's it's probably not good for our mental health, but well, that's another discussion for another day. <laughs> yeah, I, me, that would be a no. You would that would be a very a very long one. It would go back many many moons to what to how we got to this point. Well, Reese, thank you for for coming on the show. We appreciate it. It was good to hear your opinions, and uh, we'll, we'll have to do this again sometime. Okay. Sure. Thanks. All right. He's, he's Reese Gordon. Howdy 555. You might know his username. And this has been Locked on Horn Frogs. It's your team every day.